Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. We do, as Rotarians, a lot of projects around the world. And a lot of those projects are very unique, fascinating. One of the most exotic ones I've ever seen and heard of and had the fortune to meet with are the people that work with the nomads of Niger. And with us today, we have Dr. Bob Skanke, who is a Rotarian, very active in that area. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Wade. Tell us a little bit about yourself. doesn't have to be Rotary. We'd like to know a little bit about what you do. And okay, well, California born. Uh, did my uh, medical school in Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, did uh, family practice for about five years. Went back into a residency in obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, found my way down to Ojai, California, where I spent the next 35 or so years till 1997 in practice. And after that, um, life really became exciting and adventurous as I got involved with Rotary more actively and uh, have uh, done a lot of traveling um, many places in Africa, South America, Central America, the Far East. It's been really, really exciting. Um, Rotary. How did you start the Rotary career? Where did that start? And how? Uh, well, I started back in 1960 when I was in general practice wow. in San Bruno, California. And I was uh, interested in getting involved with the leaders in our, my community, in our community, and particularly those leaders who were interested in service, because that was one of my passions. And of course, as you know, Wade, uh, service above self is the motto of Rotary. And so I've had a wonderful, wonderful, exciting life, full of adventure, traveling, all thanks to Rotary. That's true, Bob. Now, you are one of the recipients of the uh, Rotary International Service Above Self Award, so congratulations to you. Thank you. There are very few of those, probably only a few thousand in the world that have received that honor. That, again, being based on your volunteerism through Rotary and outside in your community. So it's kind of fascinating that you were able to use your training, I would say, being a doctor, and bring this to Rotary to do certain specific projects. Was that something you had planned on doing? Was that part of your world plan, life plan, or just something that happened? Uh, it was my goal, and so, you know, if you uh, have a goal and you sort of keep it in mind uh, and you watch for opportunities, and that's what happened. Basically, the particular one we're going to be talking about today is in Niger or Niger, Africa. And uh, when I was giving a talk about some of my travels in my Rotary Club back in 2008, after the meeting, uh, Leslie Clark, who heads up Nomad Foundation, uh, came up to me. And she'd been very active in Niger with the nomadic people and really, really helping them a lot, but not, not, had not gotten involved in medical uh, th uh, things. And she asked me if I would be interested and she was very enthusiastic, and what could you say? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And so uh, within a year, we had a, the first clinic, permanent clinic, ever um, constructed in the, uh, the area uh, my, where, the, where these uh, uh, nomadic people uh, were living. Now, I found out something fascinating about the nomads, and that is they literally still do a rotation. They, yeah. they move from place yeah. to place on yeah. an annual basis. So that's pretty fascinating about them. Internationally, um, I had the privilege of traveling with you to Mexico. I thought that was one of those great experiences. And by the way, you're a great traveler. I enjoy traveling with you a lot. But you brought a lot to the project itself. Um, your knowledge, the ability to see things specific, that would be medical, those, those type of needs. So I'm sure this was a perfect fit for you. Yeah, it was a really, really good one. Let's start with the uh, slides. We'll go through some of these. The first slide shows a map of Africa, I believe, and you wanted to show where Niger is because right. most people do mix it up with Nigeria. Right. Or at least a portion of that. So Niger, I see, is dead center, uh, middle of the continent. Dead center. There. It's the blue one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, considered one of the hottest countries in the world, one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and that is probably mostly the Sahara Desert, then, we might yeah, guess. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Good. Next picture we have shows a picture of uh, the nomadic people, I believe, on, on camel. Right. These are Torags mm -hmm. that we're looking at right there. Okay. And uh, they're the camel people. And it's fascinating because they still have camel trains moving um, things 
where roads aren't, mm -hmm. you know, between uh, various villages. Now, are these uh, Rotarians? Do you know offhand? Because I know there's a there's actually a nomadic uh, Rotarian club. Well, there's a Rotarian club in Agadez, which okay. is in a, a fairly good sized city, and we wouldn't call them nomadic. They're they're Turogs. Okay. Uh, the same race as these, but uh, um, they became more stationary than yeah, they yeah, developed. Yeah, right. I see. Um, one of the requirements that Rotary has is that you have to have a Rotary club in the area in order to do a project with them. That was what I understood was the reason that they started that Rotary club. That's right. Uh, I'll share this with you. We have. A, I brought with me um, one of the trading banners of <laughs> <laughs> from Niger. This was the first one that that club actually put out, and it was made out of camel hide, and that was given to us, uh, given to me as one of the gifts from the group of people that came here from that. A fascinating uh, item they couldn't afford, or it actually was easier for them to make this out of uh, the hide <laughs> than it was to actually do one out of uh, yeah. you know, a painted material or something like that. A little story on that one. I put that in a, in a shadow box because when I first got it, I thought it was beautiful. I mean, it was, it was a great gift to me. But when I brought it home, my whole house smelled like a camel. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so I ended up having to move it outside. <laughs> I had to cure it for a little bit before I brought it back in again. But it was uh, one of those great gifts that, yeah, you just never forget. The next picture shows a picture, I believe, that's Leslie Clark. It's Leslie Clark. And uh, in the distant background, you can see our clinic, which uh, we constructed in uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, and uh, it was right along the migratory route of the uh, Turugs and Wadabis. One of the things that's important to note is that our water tank was donated by Rotary. Rotary just helped us so much, uh, Nom the Nomad Foundation helped us in many, many ways financially and gave us some water. That water uh, was basically used for the animals of the people who would come by. We didn't have um, uh, water in our clinic. We had to have that shipped in. OK. Uh, the water itself, does that come from wells? The water comes from wells, right? The water comes from wells. Um, th it, uh, that's the critical part. They have surface water about three times, three months out of the year when it rains a lot. But it's very, very contaminated mm -hmm. with many bad organisms. I guess so, because it's a runoff run, run off and collecting the, yeah, the water. Yeah, yeah. I heard stories also because it's so sandy there in the desert that they have to sometimes go 150, 200 feet down, hand dug a lot of these wells. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's pretty Even scary. Even further than that, wow. two or 300 feet sometimes. And I heard another story from Leslie, I believe, that said that those people that dig those wells, they can only do one in their lifetime. They just freak <laughs> out. I mean, yeah, after yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, quote, dodge the bullet and they're able to survive a cave-in of those wells. Yeah, that's like yeah, it's, it's scary. That is the, definitely the scary. air down there when they get deep is bad. I, <laughs> I bet yeah. you it would be, yeah, yeah. Next picture we have shows a structure. Uh, looks like it's made out of stone. Adobe. Adobe? Yeah. OK. Yeah. And Adobe. this is a picture Adobe. of one of the clinics, would be this, my guess? This is our clinic. OK. Yes, so we only had one in ours. And uh, it's, it's surrounded by, in this picture, by a, a number of the uh, uh, people who are really interested in getting care. One of the beauties <coughs> that we were able to do with this clinic is to really improve the health of these people significantly. Uh, first of all, uh, they would avoid going to clinics in towns and stuff because they were very, very poorly treated. In fact, yeah. the one hospital in Agadez, they only went there if they knew they were going to die, and they just that was the last thing. One of the beauties of what we did was two things. One, in this clinic, we had the best pharmacy in the whole country because we brought <laughs> ourselves over the, uh, all the medications. Uh, we brought two 50-pound bags each, and there was uh, at least three of us that come, so we'd have much as 300 pounds of medicines, which we'd get donated, uh, direct relief uh, in here in, in um, Santa Barbara was a big help for us in that. And so, number one, we had good care. And number two, we were very um, kind to them, and we appreciated them, and, and we were respectful for them, something they just hadn't gotten elsewhere. One of the, I, I, one of the things I like about it, as I've got more involved with older, uh, Rotary, to see what 
it does is that what this does is increase our positive relationship between us in the United States and those people in Niger. So they really appreciated us. Now these, uh, the people here at the clinic, how long do they stay there before they move on? Or is that, you see some of them staying there a year longer? Oh, no, that, well, these people are on, on the move. So that uh, there's certain times of the year when they're, no, when they're, they may stay as much as a few weeks, but mainly they're really on the move most of the time. So we just have a group of them that are coming through. Okay. There's, there's a few that uh, have established um, units which become semi-permanent, but those are the older people or the very younger people. Uh, the, the, those with the cattle need to be moving to right. better pastures. You got it, okay. I have a picture here showing you shaking a gentleman's hand. I believe that's you shaking a gentleman's yeah. hand. Uh, well, that's, you got uh, the uh, desert uh, cover uh, on it, I can yeah. see that. <laughs> I threw that in in the next slide just to show that we did have the a good slide. relationship and, and uh, we had developed a, a very close relationship with them. Very good. Now, my question would be is part of the uh, acceptance of that culture is it something that you do to wear their clothing or is it something that is just <laughs> comfortable? Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Comfortable. Very it's, comfortable. It's hot and it's strange. They're, they're, their um, garb is much cooler. Much cooler. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I understand. They say yeah. that uh, it insulates quite well, believe it, it or not, especially in that type of heat, uh, which, which is amazing. You wouldn't think so, but yeah. evidently it must work quite well. The next picture we see of, of a woman here with a, a child, and it looks like another child behind her. Yes. Uh, they're beautiful people, if you, as you can see. They're really, really handsome people, uh, and um, they love life. And um, they, part of our care has turned towards the um, maternal aspect, the obstetrical aspect, because um, these beautiful children or this wonderful lady, yeah, has one chance. The, the lady has one chance in seven in her lifetime of dying in labor. She had one of the highest maternal mortalities wow. in, the, uh, in the world. And so uh, we turned our attention to that uh, after we got the clinic going and established well. So it sounds like that would be one of the areas of focus that you would have yeah, the expertise yeah, exactly. to help out right, with. Right. Outstanding. Next picture down, we have a picture, I believe this <laughs> one is of the clinic, is that correct? Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, the biggest challenge, one of the big challenges we had was communication because um, they were illiterate. They did not speak English and I only spoke English. And so I had to initially had to have two interpreters and it was like almost a game. I'd have to ask <laughs> one interpreter, who, uh, Leslie Clark that happens to be, and then she would ask in French, uh, Aishisha, who is our RN who was trained there. And then Aishisha would ask the illiterate lady who was having the problem what her symptoms were. And then it would come back to me. And by the time we got back, well, it was a little hard to interpret. But uh, it was one of the challenges. The other wow. slide that you, we're going to show next. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, medications? The, yeah. Uh, whenever you prescribe medications, you've got to be able to tell the person how to take them. Wow. Now, they can't read. Okay? So we developed a, a little program of how to identify how often they're to take their pills. And if you look in the pill, uh, the one on the left lower, you got a picture of a worm, that's, that's for worms. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, two slashes on the left and two slashes on the right. That means two in the morning and two in the evening. And uh, you can see how it would work for the rest of the medication. Oh, very good. So, and it worked. <laughs> they loved it. That makes and a lot of sense to yeah. me, yeah. <laughs> good way to do that, perfect. Our next picture, we have um, some women sitting along on a the floor there. Is that also, I believe, probably in the clinic? No. Now, this gets into uh, uh, us talking a little bit about what we did to uh, correct the maternal problems we have there, the obstetrical problems. Um, we uh, built a training center, which was a, a, a little ways away from our clinic. <laughs> and then we uh, identified that these w one of the reasons these women were, had such a poor 
lifespan and had so much uh, Ill, uh, loss of life was that they had no medical care at all, never had any training. And the interesting thing is that they, within their little units uh, that are moving, their little encampments, they never had identified a one woman to take care of obstetrical areas. And so we identified, we started off, this is our first year, that's our picture of the first year, we're 2011. We uh, got three, la well, five ladies, three Turags and two Wadabis uh, from th uh, five different uh, uh, units. And uh, they were chosen by their leader, by their chief, and uh, brought them down here to train them in prenatal care and, uh, and uh, as a beginning part of, and eventually in delivery techniques and eventually and, uh, in all aspects of pregnancy and delivery. The interesting thing is uh, the three ladies uh, could not speak the same language as the other two ladies, but women being very gregarious, they got along just wonderful. Mm -hmm. and when we taught, we had to teach one language and then the other language. It was interesting. Wow. And then the next picture is probably a continuation then of that educational component? Right. One of the first things we taught, maybe one of the most important things we taught was cleanliness. And we uh, had a bowl and soap and taught them how to wash their hands. The fascinating thing was that this lady on the left there, when she got through washing her hands, she looked at her hands and said, I didn't know my hands were that color. <laughs> um, that, uh, Literally. Yeah, wow. Right. wow. She said that in her language. Was of course. Of yeah. course. Yeah. That is fascinating. <laughs> and that becomes part of the hygiene planning that you would have for right, uh, delivering right, babies? Right. So uh, that we would have them uh, actually give a, to bathe the woman in labor when she came in and made sure instead of delivering in the sand mm -hmm. like she normally would do, is delivering on a clean uh, cloth. Right. Next picture we have shows, um, actually, you're going to have to go <laughs> yeah. through that one. I have no idea <laughs> yeah, what they're doing. Right. <laughs> well, that's a model we brought over, a pelvic model, and uh, we were teaching delivery techniques. Oh, okay. um, and we, uh, it was really pretty important. For the head first delivery, uh, it was helpful in uh, teaching so that they didn't, women wouldn't get as much of a tear down below okay. at the delivery. But on breaches, we saved many kids' lives because they didn't know how to handle breaches, which is bottom first. Right, right. And we were able to teach that. This is showing head first. Oh, so that's part of the technique training yeah. that, that you have specific. Right. Okay. Then the next picture, again, same part of the uh, educational component there. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine that's the instructor in the front. Right. <laughs> this has to do with our desire to uh, develop a self-reliant program. In order to do that, we had to train teachers. So this is uh, about 2013 now. And the 2011 ladies, Miriam is the one on the right, is now become a teacher, uh, an instructor for us. And she is now teaching. So it started out with me teaching and then uh, uh, through uh, Aishisha, who is our uh, RN. Now, then Aishisha was teaching and now we actually have one of the matrones or uh, ladies who uh, take care of it teaching. So that becomes more sustainable then. You uh, have absolutely. the people there on site. Absolutely. And that would then be able to also expand the knowledge of those, those people, have more available for them. Yeah. Very good. The next picture we show a picture of ladies. It looks like they have the, the solar lights, the Unite to Lights. Yeah, Is that you, correct? Exactly right. Okay. So, uh, many fascinating things you sort of run into. Over there, they don't have any lights. And so if a girl goes into labor on her own, she doesn't really, as night, she doesn't necessarily really need it. But if you're gonna have somebody helping her, she's gotta, that help mate has gotta be able to see what's going on. And so we uh, developed those lights, which were very, very helpful. They could wrap them around their necks, the, the, uh, the uh, Matron, and therefore was able to identify what's going on at night as well as during the day, it was great. Makes sense. Now you told me one interesting story, uh, probably about a year or so ago, about the same trip that you went on, that some of the nomads actually, as culture, tradition, the women have to go out and bear their own child without the assistance of anybody out in the desert. That's right. Uh, before we s developed this program of Matrones training, uh, we had uh, the, the most common way they did it, when they went into labor with no prenatal care, 
when they went into labor, they would go out in the desert by themselves, away from their village, away from their um, unit, and uh, either were able to deliver successfully or not. Wow. And you said the uh, mortality rate was? Uh... One out of every seven women uh, in that country uh, succumbs to um, uh, their labor delivery process. Wow. The, 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 one of the, the seven things that we don't show here is um, the other two things that we did during prenatal training. And uh, another one was nutrition. And uh, on nutrition, uh, we initially were bringing over prenatal vitamins, which made a r significant amount of difference. I don't know what our time is. Good. You're good. Okay. Um, one of the first days I was in the clinic, they brought in an elderly man. S six um, uh, sons brought him in, gently put him down. He was semi-conscious. He was moaning, couldn't, wouldn't respond to anything. They said, we think he's dying. Uh, he hasn't eaten in a week, and he is, uh, hadn't had anything to drink in two days. And I looked at him, and I said, yeah, it looks like he's dying. I, and I couldn't see what the problem was, so I, we gave him some Tylenol, that's our strength, that was our uh, pain medication at that point, and I gave him some vitamins. Three days later, I get a report that he's up, talking, eating, <laughs> drinking, feeling significantly better. Not completely better, but it turns out it was the vitamins. They are, their uh, nutrition basically is a milk from their animals and uh, millet, which is a good protein, but that's it. That's their main course, and no vegetables or anything of that nature. So they have a subclinical problem with vitamins, vitamin deficiency. And um, we, this occurred time and time again. And uh, so carrying that on to our pregnancy situation, uh, as many as half of the women that do die, they die of postpartum hemorrhage. They bleed to death afterwards. Yeah. And the reason for that is that uterus will not contract down. And so it's blood vessels that are left open uh, bleed. And the reason they don't contract down is they usually get dehydrated, their nutrition is poor, and they're exhausted. And so uh, um, we dis distributed to our matrones. One of the things we distributed besides vitamins was we distributed a medication called mesoprostol, which clamps down that uterus really, really, really good. So initially, the first few years that, that, that we used this, they were, our matrons used that quite a bit. They used them uh, and saved many, many lives. Okay, the last year, 2015, 2014, only one dose was used after those, uh, for the whole 15 people. Why? because the key thing was good prenatal care. They were getting hydrated, by the way, in hydration. Uh, and the way we took care of that was every time they take a drink of water, they take a drink of water for their babies, double their hydration. Nutrition, we had prenatal vitamins, which eventually has been uh, replaced by uh, a tree that grows out there called moringa. This, this is a sort of a magical tree. Uh, miraculous tree because the leaves have all these essential, pre they're like prenatal vitamins. They have the essential um, vitamins and um, other nutrients, iron and good things. Yeah, you told me about the moringa tree, by the way, and I did see some of those in Honduras. They're actually no, using oh, oh, those now. Yeah, yeah. they've become very, very popular. They have, very, yeah. very, very good. So, Last picture we have shows a young family, uh, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, with a new baby. With it's a new baby. Yeah, 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 and uh, just a, 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 a reminder of the fact that uh, now over, uh, after 500 deliveries, we have not lost a mother wow. and uh, not lost a baby who was born alive. We've had some problems, but we're, we're on babies that uh, have had problems during the pregnancy. But so we've had significant success That's with outstanding. Really significant yeah. success. <laughs> That's definitely and, making a difference. Yeah, and the program is now functioning on its own. We got uh, that nurse, was Aisha Shah, is over there running the program. She's got instructors. She's got three, uh, three very good instructors. 
and then we've got 15 uh, units that have got these ladies in working. The these, way, these ladies are just, um, well, it would amaze you because totally illiterate, but they are, uh, their ability to remember, they remember everything I told them, everything we taught them two or three years later. Wow. It's just amazing. Wow. That is. The plans that you have uh, in place right now seem to be working well, but do you uh, anticipate expanding the uh, education component of this to reach more people? Is that something that Rotary's going to be doing, that you'll be doing? Um, right now we're looking into uh, putting you know, onto film or some means our, our teach my teaching program. Uh, in fact, I'm meeting in a few days with a person who's going to be helping with this through Rotary, right. through Rotary sponsored. And then I'm always l on the lookout for any place, uh, developing country who has a situation that I can go and teach the, uh, the midwives and develop midwives to help right. them. Yeah, so bring them on. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you're serious about that because I've seen your work. <laughs> you do outstanding things there, Bob, and we sure Thank appreciate you. that. The other portions of this project, you, you talked about nutrition, things like that, and all the different areas. Is that all coordinated through one effort, or do you have actually different grants, different programs set in place for these? Um, for example, uh, well, well, our grants are divided into our trips. Okay. Okay. And so, so we go at least once a year, sometimes twice. We usually spend three weeks, uh, and so uh, we use grants to help us. But when we get over, as far as training the women, we uh, uh, put everything into two to three week intensive course which somehow or another they remember and they get excited about and they work with and they make happen. <laughs> um, so uh, no, we don't, you split it up by trips. That's by basically trips. how it does. And it really takes two trips to nail everything down really good. And then um, we, uh, we've gone over, almost every year gone over and checked out. And we'll get out and go into the various encampments and visit with them and uh, find that, uh, be amazed what they can do. Uh, um, they've even learned how to take blood pressures because toxemia, pardon me, hypertension is a problem uh, that occurs also. And uh, remarkable. Well, Bob, with that, thank you very much for your time. We sure appreciate yeah. it. It's fascinating, fascinating what you've been doing for Rotary and, and with your life. And definitely appreciate you taking the time to do something outstanding as this and saving yeah. that many lives. Uh, Way. Amazing. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, with that, thank you everybody for um, attending our show. Hopefully you learned a little bit about this on what Rotary actually does. Bob here is from Ojai. He's from the Rotary Club of Ojai. Um, Leslie Clark's uh, actual foundation, the Nomad Foundation, you will also find in Ojai. So take a look at that, see what they have. Some fascinating things going out there and it's amazing what Rotary can do reaching out around the world. With that, thank you. We will see you next time.